This Fleet Equipment unscripted interview is presented by Hendrickson, a leading manufacturer of heavy-duty suspension systems and components to the global commercial transportation industry. Visit hendrickson-intl.com to learn more. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Morgan, Content Director for Fleet Equipment, and welcome to Fleet Equipment Unscripted. Today, we're talking with J.T. Roberson, Strategic Sales Manager at Ceramex. J.T., thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Excited to dive into a lot of talk about after treatment systems because engine emissions and specifically in regard to regulation is a huge talking point right now. We've got the upcoming EPA GHG 27 uh, ruling. It's requiring an 80 percent NOx reduction. Uh, how do you see emission systems and the maintenance uh, that goes in with those playing a role in a fleet's long term decarbonization strategy? It's an excellent question, Jason. So. Uh, Political winds change, as the first thing I can say, they change. And they've changed a little bit, we feel, in the industry. So with that change in that wind, it seems like there's a pause that's being put on implementing this sooner, uh, as soon as they are anticipating. So looks like it may be put on pause for a period of time. But whether it's put on pause or not, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. So when that does come about, there's a, uh, a few things that fleet owners can do. Uh, we have two sectors that we deal with, or two types of customers rather we deal with. One that's being reactive to their after treatment system. So they have no PM cycle set up to do anything with their DPF. They're just reacting to a failure and, and moving on, buying a new one. We have others that are setting their PM schedules already and they're far and few in between that number they're on a, a proactive schedule. So over the between now and when the program for the EPA 27 does come into effect, the ones that are already setting that program are kind of a slow drip on their finances, establishing that program. So they're seeing that expense spread out. So when EPA 27 comes into effect, the people that are being reactive are going to get hit all at once with the expense of getting their fleet up to par. And it's going to be a big expense up front. One of the great things about the fleets that are already uh, doing the preventative maintenance on their uh, cycles, is they've got a competitive edge in the market because they're, they're not going to be taking that impact all at once, number one. And number two, uh, they're already running a program where their filters are lasting longer on the truck between the uh, downtime. Right. Um, that about the best I got on that. <laughs> Right. Well, and, and two things that jump out me there. I think you're right to frame it on the political side because, yeah, things do swing around. But uh, I was act actually just at heavy duty aftermarket week last week. Lots of lots of uh, enthusiasm and optimism there, but uncertainty. And these regulations don't change quickly, especially the ones that are already solidified and will need to. It'll take some time to uh, uh, shake out to figure out how those will change. From from uh, to your point, manufacturers have already gone down this road of GHG 27 engines. Um, it, and if you frame it as a, a uh, operational productivity uh, point of view, this it, it's all still in play, right? It, I, I think you're right to say, hey, it's not a, a great idea to start shifting strategies immediately based on a lot of this uncertainty. What could happen, though, is uh, when they do pull the trigger on it, there's a difference between them implementing this program and mandating it. So the EPA right. could, they're doing that over overseas, one of our partners over there, they're experiencing it where it's mandated by the government that, it, that it's done. So more regulatory and it, it could possibly go that route. Right, right. Well, and to your other point too, a lot of fleets do just say, well, run a regen, right? Ah, just regen it, right? They don't get to that root problem or address the root engine uh, maintenance issue. I know that when you do address that or you have the proactive maintenance, you know, replacing DPF, uh, I know, is something that's always on fleet's minds. Do we replace it? There's also a restoration process. I know you all do uh, do work there. Can you give me an idea of how that works? What is the res restoration process for a DPF? What's the turnaround time and the confidence a fleet manager to have in that process? Okay, excellent question. So Ceramex is located in, in the heart of the Ozarks in southwest Missouri. 30,000 square foot facility. We're not a, a, a radiator shop or a garden variety DPF cleaner. This is all we do is the after treatment system. It's a repetitive mm -hmm. process day in and day out so that every day the same process happens, we have the same result. 
So with that being said, we have tens of thousands that have been processed through our building over the past 10 years that we've been doing this here locally. Well, I say here, look, we've still been doing it nationally, but out of our local place. Um, For sure. When the filter comes in from the customer, we take it to our expert. That's our first, we have two unique patented technologies that we use. The expert is, uses a, uh, a deionized water. It, and the reason for the deionized water, so we're not using city water or well water, so we're not introducing metals and other contaminants into the filter because the, fil the substrate has other precious metals in it too. You don't want some kind of reaction to happen where it degrades or destroys the filter. So we go with the deionized water. And uh, after, it's, after it's restored through that part of the process, we, it goes into a, a, an oven, a drying process, to remove all the moisture and the water out of it. And that, that's the, the bulk of the time is the drying process. So after it comes out of the drying process, it's moved over to a flow test to see what our flow rate is to make sure that they're, it's able to, to breathe, that the flow rate's right. Moved over to our mm -hmm. second patented technology, which is our Veritex imaging. Our Veritex imaging is basically the uh, best way to look at it. It's like an x-ray of the substrate. So you can see internally. So when mm -hmm. unique in that, us being able to do that on every filter that goes through our, our building, looking internally, we can see cr internal cracks and melts uh, or other anomalies to find out what's wrong with it. And if, if it's something that's we're questionable, we'll then boroscope a cell or two around it to find out if it's a vertical or a horizontal crack. And then uh, if it has one of those, we notify the customer that, you know, that their filter, filter had failed and uh, ask what they want to do for next steps. Uh, after that Veritex imaging, it's moved over to our detailers. These uh, workers are over there detailing every filter that comes through. They're knocking off all the gasket matter, polishing it up so that whenever the customer receives that filter back, it's ready to install. The, uh, anywhere there's adhesion or a spot where the gaskets go, it's clean. The shop's not having to clean off the filter or do any kind of prep. There's no accountability on their side for making sure that it was done correctly. We take that responsibility on ourselves. So after it's received in that process, it is put in that it's shipped back out to the customer. It takes 24 hours just to process. Oh wow! Okay, and so, so it, if I'm a fleet, the DPF I send you is the one I get that back. This isn't like a reman thing where I'm getting a filter back. I'm getting my filter back. Correct. Correct. There are okay. some programs. I'm not glad you asked that. So the customer scale. It's not a matter if it. it the customer sends one or two hundred. We might get if. That, that one sends one, they're going to get it back in 24 hours. We ha have trucks pull up, we unload them, got 200 filters on it. We're not doing a 24 hour on it. It's going to take a week. So at the end of the week, a week later, we're shipping those uh, trailer load of 200 back to them. So every one of them validated back to the OE spec. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's a one for one. We do have other programs that we've developed with some other customers for an exchange program. Absolutely. For those that would qualify for uh, the volume and the uh, uh, logistics. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's really that's an interesting process. Right. So how do how do you recommend fleet managers value the ROI on this kind of thing? Right. I'm going to I'm going to get in this program. Maybe it's a one for one. Maybe I can work a larger deal and we can get kind of a supply cycle going. Um, just how do I look at the, the ROI on that kind of a process? So first I'd like to talk about the skeptic and then the ROI. Is that okay? Okay, per that's perfect. That's perfect. I love it. Skeptical of what we do and how we do it. We offer a program called the Ceramex Challenge. So for them to find out truly what there are uh, what's going on with their fleet and their current clean, we just ask that fleet to contact us. We'll set up the uh, shipping and uh, bring that filter that they've just had cleaned. We'll receive it. We'll do uh, a test prior to cleaning it, and that's gonna be the Veritex imaging, pre-weight, pre-flow test. We'll run it through our system. After it comes out, we record everything again and new imaging. So then you have a, a clear picture, not just some numbers that say, hey, it went from this to this. We have the clear imaging. Right. And we'll do that for, uh, for, for customer base as well, for you know, fleets that qualify for it, absolutely. So there's a basically a, a, a no risk, trial to check it out. So for the ROI on that, and we're talking about the cost savings overall for the fleet, depends on a few things. 
uh, one is the vocation. You know, are you a line haul where you're getting the eight mile per hour uh, or eight miles per gallon rather fuel economy? You got a clean burn. You're doing a passive regen. You never notice it. Uh, hardly any soot or ash being produced. You've got your trash truck, and that guy's just producing ash and soot all day long. The guy, the stop and go, or the super regional fleets are going to see a return on that quicker. Reason, reason being, if they are buying, just replacing with a new filter, if you can stick with the OE, you're upwards of three or four thousand dollars. Call it half that price for an aftermarket. We're a quarter of that, somewhere in there. It's a big savings. Yeah, well, and going back to the data thing too, I, do you do you ever have instances of fleet? You know, because fleets are really looking to crunch data and trying to improve maintenance practices as well. Are they? Do you have any instances of them being able to use the data that you can you can provide on that insight onto why or what's going on with that DPF, and maybe they can infer with other data they have operationally why it's failed, or start to see trends overall in in the maintenance side of that. It's, it, that's a great question. Uh, yes, we do. I, I, I tell customers there are some that are concerned about the, the, the data. Some of them just want it restored and returned to them. I, I tell the right. customer, let me know what, that you want to know more. So if they're they're doing their PM at, um, at 30, 300,000 miles, they're doing a 300,000 mile, they tell me, hey, collect some data. So when it comes in, we make sure our guys collect a little extra data, I report it specifically back to that person and I can tell them, hey, you know what? We removed this much ash. Um, the Veritex imaging I share with them through email rather than it just being on file. I share it with them, let them know how much weight. And then we can say, okay, so maybe you can take it out a little further on your PM. So maybe you could take it out to 350. And then after that, try it again, report it. And it's like, hey, might go the other way. They might send it in at 300,000 and it's completely packed and we say we need to dial it back some. So we, we can help them. We won't recommend that PM cycle. We'll just help them get the information so they can make an informed decision. Yeah, for sure, because even from the fleet perspective, then if I am packing those DPF filters way sooner than I think I am, I mean, that's an upstream issue potentially within the engine that I need to start diagnosing and troubleshooting, and it's showing up there, right? I loved your X-ray analogy. I think that's really cool, being able to see what's going on inside there. I think that's super helpful. Yeah. It's a unique process. Uh, I hate to say it's been around for 10 years, but our heritage, we were working with the OEs for uh, seven the first seven years of that, just working with the OEs. Having that background with them, we know what it needs to perform like to satisfy an OE. For sure. JT, I appreciate you taking the time. I learned a ton here talking to you. I'm sure I'll talk to you again very soon. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.